Christ is risen. Alleluia. Oh, brothers and sisters, so good. Last night was unbelievable. Who was here last night? Wow. We had, the church was so packed. We had 20 baptisms. Four people came into the church and five others received confirmation along with the rest of them. It was the biggest Easter vigil we've ever had. It blew out the walls by like 550 people. It was crazy. It was crazy. It was so beautiful. And it just shows you that even in the midst of the darkness of this world, the light of Christ is still shining. The light of Christ is still calling people out of darkness into light. Amen? It's so beautiful. It's so good. And what is the message of today? The message of today is death can be defeated. The thing that is going to consume all of us, the thing that we are desperately trying to avoid thinking about, that you're going to die someday. Some of you faster than others, right? But the, I don't know. It could be me too. We don't know. None of us have any guarantee. We could be perfectly healthy and just drop dead. We have no guarantee about how long our life will be. We're so fragile, and we live our life in the illusion that somehow it will keep on going, and yet we know it won't. There's going to come a time when you and I will die. That is absolutely certain. But what isn't certain is what happens next, and that's why we're so anxious about death. That's why we're so afraid of it. And we should be, because I have not met anybody in my life who has lived longer than 105 years, okay? Maybe you know somebody who's lived a little bit longer, but pretty much it's only a couple years after that, and then they're gone. And so we have to answer the question, is it possible that there's something after death? Everyone has to come to that question. And the answer is yes, there is. There's a judgment. There's a judgment that happens after death. And the fact is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the judge of the living and the dead, because he alone has the power of life and death in himself. He's the only one who has risen from the dead on his own power, and because of that, everything else he said is true. This is what's so important we recognize this, friends. There's so many people out there who think that Jesus is just a nice guy. No, he isn't. He didn't give us that option of being nice guy. It's like nice guy checkbox. No, that wasn't Jesus, okay? Jesus is either the living word of God, the very manifestation of God. He either is or he's a liar. And you shouldn't listen to anything he says because he said, I'm God and you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay, what normal person says that? Not a normal person, not a wise man, maybe a wise guy, but not a wise man. Okay, the fact is, friends, you have to really come to grips with the fact that if somebody tells you to eat their flesh and drink their blood or else you have no life in you, that guy is definitely nuts unless he's God. So the whole, the whole project, the whole project of Jesus, all of his teaching, all of his miracles, everything he said, all depends on whether he actually rose from the dead, which is why we say Christ is risen, alleluia, and the response is he is risen indeed, alleluia. It's not a fantasy, it's not a fable, it's not a storybook that we tell children to make them behave. It really happened. And because it really happened, you know that if you're on his team, he'll give you life too. And that's what baptism is all about, receiving his life in you so that when you die, you will not die, in fact, but you will live forever. You will not lose your eternal life, but it is given to you and you will live with him forever. That's what's promised to us. Unless he rose from the dead, it's all a sham. Go home, right? But from, judging from the size of the packed church in here, I don't think you guys think this is a story or a fable. I hope not. We have to look and see what are the reasons to believe in this. I think the gospel itself shows us very clearly the reason for this. Now, first, all these readings are saying, look, we were witnesses of this. Peter says it. Friends, you heard about Jesus, right? And, and this is, you know, it's, it's really amazing. He went around doing miracles, right? Freeing those who are oppressed by the devil. We are witnesses to what he did. They hung him on a tree and then on the third day he rose and we saw him and we ate with him. So this isn't a story that we're making up. We ate with him, and he commissioned us to preach. Now, if he didn't actually rise from the dead, this is pretty dumb, right? You're not going to get a book deal in the first century, okay? You're just going to get a death sentence because everyone is hunting for those disciples of Jesus. They're trying to eliminate them because they don't like Jesus. He's a rabble rouser. They don't like anybody associated with him. If he really didn't rise, you're not going to die for a lie. And every single one of them died really horrendous deaths. So that's one point that we can believe it's a true story, right? Because if you didn't really rise from the dead, I don't know about you, but as soon as I have my fingernails peeled off, and be like, stop, I'm just kidding, he didn't rise, <laughs> right? If he didn't actually rise, you know, Bartholomew had his skin peeled off, flayed alive, 
okay, that's not pleasant. He didn't change his story. Peter crucified upside down. Andrew crucified on an X-shaped cross. James killed by the sword. Andrew beaten with clubs, right? I mean, all these people, like, you just recognize, look, they died horrible deaths, and none of them changed their story. It was all the same. They could not deny what they had seen and what they had touched. The word of life. Then we come to the gospel, and we see these remarkable details that actually, you don't have to just take their word for it. We actually have proof today. We're going to look at this. Look at what happens. They go into the tomb. What do they see in the tomb? They know. What do they see? The burial cloths. Isn't that interesting? If they just stole the body, who is going to take the time to unwrap a body? If you're a thief, you want to get in and get out, right? They've unwrapped the body, and you have a lot of linens that are wrapping it up, right? And they're just taken off and neatly put away. And you're like, that's weird. Thieves don't do that. Something odd is happening here. Not only that, but if you think about it, he was embalmed with 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Okay? That's a lot of liquid. Those linens are pretty sticky. So that's really tough to peel it off of him, right? Oh, and also, friends, they probably looked at this burial cloth and realized that there's something interesting. There's marks on it. And in fact, you can see these today. How have you ever heard of the Shroud of Turin? Okay? We actually have the burial cloths of Jesus. They're in Turin, Italy. And in fact, we actually have a, a group here locally that has a life-size replica of it. We'll try and get it here a little bit later this year. We've had it here before. The fact is, friends, is that you look at this shroud, and what's remarkable about it is that um, we cannot recreate it today. We cannot recreate it with modern technology. What's so remarkable about this shroud is that they took a picture of it for the first time in the 1800s, because it's been around for hundreds of years, right? They took a picture of it for the first time in the late 1800s, and when the guy was developing the photos, the negative shocked him because it looks, it, the negative like shows a full body image of, of a man. And they're like, wow, we didn't know this. It's really not showing us a positive image. It's actually showing us a negative. So the negative of a negative is a positive, right? Oh, that's confusing. I apologize, okay? But the fact is the shroud is actually a negative image of what happened. And, and we can't paint it. It's not pigmentation. It's not dyes. But what happens is, is basically scientists, their best guess is how this image is on the shroud is that there was a huge burst of gamma radiation that imprinted the image. Like, huh, interesting, a burst of radiation at the moment of the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? You know what's also fun? They just excavated the tomb of Jesus in Jerusalem. How many have you been to Jerusalem? Have you in there? Go. Okay, we need to get a pilgrimage. I was going to have one and it got canceled. That's another story. Make it happen. Okay, we'll make it happen. Okay, next year, Jerusalem. Okay, when you go to the tomb of Jesus, there is a slab that covers the original slab, and, it's, and, and when they were excavating it, their instruments were off. Like, they thought it was shallower, and they found it was a lot deeper. And so when they pulled off the lid, and they found that actually it messed with their instruments, there was actually radiant radiation that was messing with their instruments. They calculated it, and it's like, it's like a nuclear bomb went off about 2,000 years ago. is not a fable. People tell you, oh, it just doesn't matter what you believe. It absolutely does. Jesus is the only one whose really, really story happened. All the other gods are fake. He isn't just a wisdom teacher like, like Confucius or like Buddha or like <clears throat> anybody else. It's Jesus is God and he rose from the dead and the glory and the power of God that created the universe right, is in him. And he wants to be in you. That's the message of the gospel. And those who received the sacraments last night, who here woke up from the sacraments last night? You're all here? I see a few of you that got baptized last night, okay, and we're here. Right, friends, the glory of God is a real thing. It's a real power. And in the sacraments of the church, you receive them. In baptism, you receive the light of Christ. In confirmation, you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the blessed Eucharist, friends, that same God who rose from the dead, that same God-man, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, wishes to live in you. But friends, if that's true, what does St. Paul say? Friends, so that you can be a fresh batch of dough, clear out the old yeast. Do you not know a little bit of yeast leavens the whole dough? He's saying, 
This may be a small thing. The Eucharist may be a small host. It may look like something insignificant to you. But in fact, it is the power of God. And it will leaven your whole life into eternity. Far more than you could ever ask for or imagine. But for that to happen, you need to get rid of the old yeast. What is that? The yeast of malice and wickedness and sin. You cannot expect to receive him and have darkness in you at the same time. You must repent of your sins before you receive this banquet. You must go to confession before you receive this banquet. Otherwise, the toxic yeast of sin will ruin you. As I mentioned last night, when we were bringing in the light of Christ, the Paschal candle, we were bringing it in and everybody's candles were lit. We recognize there can be no partnership between light and darkness. Wherever light goes, it drives out the darkness, right? So they cannot be friends. Light and darkness are not friends. They are mutually opposed to each other. So Christ is opposed to sin. If you have sin in you and you're not willing to give it up, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to give up Jesus or you're going to give up your sin. When people, when the darkness comes in, what do they want to do? <sniffs> want to put out the light. So that's what's going to happen in your life. And that's what's going to happen to all the baptized. You're going to have to make a decision every single day to say, am I going to choose today to live for Jesus or am I going to live for my sin? Am I going to obey him or am I going to obey the world? Because friends, I tell you what, has the world ever given you one more minute of life? Has the world ever been able to bring somebody back from the dead? Stop it. Stop thinking that your phone will give you eternal life. Stop thinking the TV will give you eternal life. Stop thinking fornication will give you eternal life or drugs or anything else that is sinful. It will not give you eternal life. There's only one who can and it's Christ Jesus and we better obey him because he's the only one I know who's ever come back from the dead on his own power. That's it. Pretty simple, right? Happy Easter, friends. I'm so grateful you're all here, friends. This is so good to welcome you all here. So many of guests with family and friends visiting. Friends, realize this. Jesus wants a relationship with you that's not just once a week. That's not just a couple times a year. That is every single day, every single moment of your life because Jesus is your life if you're baptized. He's not just an added feature to your life. He's not just a hobby or a side thing for you. No, he must be your life. It's so radical. Christianity is radical. It's not this little simple thing that is so uh, maligned in culture today. No, you have to be a saint. Every single day, every moment is Jesus' time now. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Clear out the old yeast. Become the bread that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.